please stand with me for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Oh boy. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, my Lord, my Rock, and my Redeemer. Amen. This teaching is difficult, and uh, not just the one that I'm about to give to you. Uh, I hope it's not terribly difficult. But the teaching of Christ uh, that we uh, read this morning, that we also heard about last week, is a difficult teaching. This teaching uh, of eating his flesh and drinking his blood and thereby having uh, communion with God the Father, thereby being accepted by God through this strange act of eating Jesus. You know, what does Jesus taste like? Uh, how is it that uh, we get all these good things from this simple uh, act that he, he commissions for us in bread and wine in the Holy Supper? How does all this stuff work? That's a hard teaching or a difficult teaching. But even more so than that, uh, if you were to look at the, the Greek words, and I'll spare you, right? Uh, if you look at the Greek words, it actually means like offensive. Like it riles people up. It's uh, the kind of words that could start a riot, okay? Uh, it's that good, what he, is, what he is claiming to these people. And they say, man, who can accept this teaching that Jesus has for us? It's, uh, it seems beyond the pale. They uh, rightly understand that the word that Jesus is giving to them it's not just a, a simple statement of fact, though it's at least that, right? This is indeed the body and blood of Christ. Uh, and certainly he gives it uh, for the life of the world. Uh, that is for your life and for my life, thank goodness. So he is most certainly doing those things. But there's more to it than that. Uh, there's a deeper sense behind all of this. Uh, and it should be an offensive word. It is, uh, it is by definition an offensive word. Offense, right? When we think about that, we think of, I am offended. It's what you've done to me uh, when you make me feel bad or what have you. But it, uh, it has its roots in offense, right? So if you're uh, at the football game and you've got the ball and you're charging down the field wanting to, to uh, knock people over and make your way to the end zone, guess what? You're on offense. Uh, you are attacking and trying to drive things forward. And make no mistake that the word of God is an offensive word. It isn't uh, an accident that it happens that way, but it's God's desire that you hear it and you go, oh man, hold on just a second. This is a problem for me. And, and I assure you that this word of Christ, it's a problem. You know, nowadays uh, there is, uh, and especially within these last couple of years, there's a huge push for, uh, for offense to be taken out of the public sphere, right? So that is to say, like, we want a safe space. A safe space, not just from violence, but from the violence of having to endure the opinions of others. 
And while I can most certainly identify with that uh, from time to time, uh, and I'm sure anyone who has to sit around uh, with me uh, too often can identify with that all too well, uh, the truth is, is that to escape offense is impossible, right? Because you and I are sinful people, and when we share our sinful ideas with sinful others, we are going to offend people. We're going to step on toes, and it's not something that we can escape. And we don't see God trying to escape the nature of his word, uh, but we instead see him doubling down, saying like, yeah, this is an offensive word. If you think that's bad, friends, just you wait. Uh, I like it. God sounds super tough that way. I usually think of Jesus as being, uh, for a guy in Birkenstocks, you know, you, you don't wear those when you come to, to kick some tail. <laughs> or so I've heard. But, but Jesus does. He's coming, uh, be, and he means business. And we see in our epistle reading today, right, from, uh, from Paul, that the word of God is a sword. That, uh, and Jesus says this uh, about himself. John, in uh, the book of Revelation, uh, the word of God that comes from the mouth of Jesus is always depicted as a sword. It's something used to attack, and not just to attack and to send you running away. But if it does what it's supposed to do, you die. It's a dangerous word, and it is indeed an offensive word. So then what uh, is the offense? Because frankly, like the idea of eating and, and drinking the body and blood of Jesus Christ is a weird doctrine, to be sure. Uh, it sounds strange. It's maybe hard to wrap your mind around. Um, but is it so offensive that people stop following him? Is it so offensive that you would turn your back on Christ? And I don't think that it's uh, what the text is actually telling us at all. Rather, uh, he's explaining this, and they say, well, that's a really difficult teaching. Uh, we don't like it very much. Um, but he goes on to explain this, and he doesn't explain the body and the blood anymore, right? Which he was doing in last week's reading. He doesn't go on to say, no, hold on, like the body's like this and the blood is like this. But instead, he points out to them where the offense lies, right? That the Spirit of God is the only thing that has the capacity to give life. And that the Spirit of God is present in its fullness in Jesus Christ. And that is to say, if you want the Spirit of God, if you want to have the Holy Spirit, and you want to have that uh, experience, you have it through Jesus Christ. If you want to see God the Father, you see Him through the person of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is the fullness of God in human flesh. That in Him is found everything that we seek for when we truly seek God. But the truth is that not, we don't always truly seek God. And that uh, this is not a new phenomenon either. It is not something that uh, uh, was ushered in uh, recently. But it's from the beginning. Uh, Aristotle, smart guy. With a name like Aristotle, you've got to be really smart. Uh, they don't even give his last name. It's like Madonna, just Aristotle. <laughs> he, uh, he has this to say. Now I'm going I'm to make a joke about Aristotle's name, and I won't be able to remember the quote. Oh, it's going to kill me. That, uh, oh, golly. If you guys don't know it, you can't just throw it back my way. I saw where you were going with this, Pastor. We're going to save you from yourself. You know what? Forget it. We're going to pass Aristotle. <laughs> this, that ship has sailed. That, uh, what Jesus is, uh, is explaining to people, okay, here's Aristotle. Dang it, I knew it would come back. People love to have their ideas uh, said back to them. He says this in a book about rhetoric, which is how to speak in public. You want people to like you when you speak in public? Here's what you do. Figure out what their ideas are, and then you tell it to them, and they'll think you're the greatest person ever, right? Th that's the way that we avoid misunderstanding, because it's a way to signal we're all on the same page, right? It's a way uh, to communicate uh, the things that we hold uh, dear and that we hold dear together, right? It's a way to build bonds of acceptance, you know, Jesus uh, isn't doing this. Instead, he is doing the exact opposite. He's saying, there is only one way, and I am the way. And the, the problem that the disciples have is uh, not about the body and the blood, but what it means for the body and blood of Christ to be the only means of acceptance for God the Father. Uh, that means that all of their ancestors could only be accepted through Christ, a guy who they saw standing in front of them. A fellow that we knew uh, lived and walked on this earth 2,000 years ago, but their parents and their grandparents and their great-grandparents didn't see. That their ideas uh, of religion and what made, us, uh, made them acceptable to God are very similar to many people's today. Grandma was a Lutheran, right? And it's like, that's, first off, that's a good start. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but it's not the finish, right? That it isn't uh, rather by your birth, 
It isn't by knowing the right answers. It isn't uh, by memorizing the creeds and so forth that you have access to God the Father or that you're accepted by him. You're accepted through only one thing, and that is through Jesus Christ himself. And that it isn't about your education or your ability to understand or to comprehend how the body and the blood is present in the, uh, in the supper. It isn't about those things at all. But it's about knowing that Jesus Christ is God given for you. Uh, this is the problem. Because if that's true, then nothing else works. Then nothing else works. Then all of the things that we engage in in our life as we uh, try to be good people, you know, and you should try to be a good person because it doesn't work as good if you don't. But as you go about your life trying to be a decent human being, um, Jesus is telling you, that's not going to help you at all with God. That isn't what God is seeking from you. That isn't how, what the foundation of your relationship to God. Uh, the ways that used to work, the ways that you have built up in your mind that seem right, that make sense to you, they're not God's way. God has only one way, and that way is through Jesus Christ. And that's it. That's it. And it is uh, for this, he says, uh, that he says, for this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. That even the acceptance of Jesus Christ, which I, I hope that all of you here do, and if you're new to that, come and see me, and we'll baptize you, and we'll, we'll do this proper, I promise. But none of us has even come to God apart from Christ. Nobody uh, sought him out because of our wise judgments, because of the good choices, because of the wonderful things that we read. But God first saw you in your sin, saw you dead, and called you to life in Jesus Christ. You don't get to take any of the credit which is, by human religious standards, really lame. Because it would be great uh, to say, I have done one thing right in my life. I have, w I have done, uh, this w in this one place, done something so good that it redeemed all of the other things. That work, friends, belongs to Jesus Christ. And it's because of this that the disciples, uh, and remember, these are disciples. They're us. They turn away. And they, they no longer, it says, uh, went about with him, which sounds like a 1950s way of saying dated, but really it's just they walked with him and followed him. They no longer did that. Um, why? Because they couldn't take the credit. Because faith had to be a gift. Because that's the way that God wants it to be. And today, uh, friends, you and I are going to receive a gift. You're going to receive that uh, offensive body and blood of Jesus Christ given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And uh, guess what? If you don't want your sins to be forgiven, it doesn't matter. Uh, in his body and blood, you are forgiven. If you uh, accept it or you are not ready to accept it, uh, still in this bread and in this wine, in his body and in his blood, you are forgiven. God has made a decision uh, for each and every one of you to call you and to draw you to himself to uh, take out of your hands and out of your control the most important thing that could ever be uh, ever be done or ever be chosen in your life and that is to belong to him and he has chosen for you because he loves you he loves you so much I'm not going to let you mess this one up he asks uh, ultimately the twelve right do you also wish to go away? And Simon Peter uh, answers him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. This is Christ, friends. Eternal life. Body and blood. Given and shed. For you. The Spirit of God working through the word. For you. You are his purchase. You are his possession. Uh, you are God's desire. Come and and be fed and receive him, uh, be joined together in him. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you uh, because you are not just our God, but our Savior. You have not left uh, our salvation to chance. You have saved us and done the work yourself. Lord, we thank you for that wonderful gift. Uh, we pray that you would prepare us to receive your body and your blood. Uh, and though we don't understand perfectly 
how you are joined together in these elements. Lord, we trust you are here because you are trustworthy. We praise you uh, for these things and ask them through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.